grounds. And uh, uh, either here or in Jerusalem in our ministry there, because when there's that greater glory, there's a greater spirit of revelation. And what God wants to do in this last day is to lead us forth by the spirit of revelation. Amen? That that revelatory realm of the spirit is working in us. Now, brother, uh, just was singing the song, the cloud of glory is moving, move with the cloud. And you know it's wonderful, but have you ever thought how that sometimes the cloud is so faint in the sky? Amen. You've got to look for it. Amen. Uh, there are other times that you, uh, you see the cloud very distinctly, but there are days that you just look and you have to discern it. Amen. You have to look for the cloud. It's not the, the substance that this podium is made of. Oh, it's something very light and, uh, and misty, amen. And you have to look for it in the realm of the Spirit. That's why you can only know the things of the Spirit as you're in the Spirit. Amen. That's why we come in here and we praise and we worship and we come into the glory. But when you come into the glory, and don't stop until you do. Don't stop in a service. You know when you've passed from praise to worship into glory. Amen. Everybody has got to be the, the, the thermometer for himself. Amen. You've got to be. Sometimes we come into the service and we're right there. Other times it takes a little longer. But keep on because even if you're listening to the preaching, you know, sometimes I see people sitting out and they got a book and they're, and they're reading, partially reading a book, doing the preaching, or they're partially planning, you know, next year's uh, uh, program or whatever. No, we have to sit even listening to the Word in the glory because it's not only the Word that's spoken, but it's the atmosphere on the person when it's spoken. Amen. And when you've got that glory upon you and then they, they speak forth, some of you notice I sometimes just automatically jump. There's a quickening. Uh, you know, it's not planned. There's a quickening of the spirit uh, that goes from the preacher to the one that's listening. And if you say, well, I was in that meeting. I didn't get anything. It's your fault. And the reason it's your fault is because you haven't moved out of the realm of your thinking, out of the realm of the cares of the day, out of the realm of those things that are happening round about. You've got to move out. And then in the speaking, that quickening comes. And the preacher says one word, and it's like it's expanded. Amen. Illuminated. You find an illumination of the Spirit of God that comes into your spirit. In that moment... I was thinking this morning before I came down, I've only, I only remember being miserable once in God. You know, serving God, I can only remember one period I was very miserable. And usually if you're miserable, you're struggling against the will of God. You're of two opinions, two opinions. And you know, if you're feeling a little miserable, you're struggling. You're struggling against the will of God. Now, in my own life, I was planning to get married. <clears throat> and uh, the Lord spoke to me uh, concerning not marrying the person, even though they were a very fine person. We remain good friends until this day. I just saw him and his wife a couple of days ago and their family. But the Lord spoke to me, <clears throat> and then right after, you know what happens, right after God speaks to you about something, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody else goes along with what God says to you. And I recall that a few days later, I was in Hong Kong, he called and he said, oh, I'm going to be in Hong Kong next week to marry you. 
Now, I'd been waiting, you know, months, months for him to come, and he hadn't come, and God had spoken to me about not marrying him, and I said, yes, Lord. But now, <laughs> now he's on the way. I, and you know how we can quote scriptures to justify, you know? Well, God only wanted me to be willing you know, it was like with Abraham offering Isaac, and uh, as long as uh, Abraham was willing, he actually gave Isaac back. And, you know, we can quote all these scriptures uh, so we can do anything we want to do. You know, we can talk ourselves into most anything we want to do and have a scripture to back it up. And I thought, well, the Lord just wanted to see if I was willing. And when he found out I was willing to give him up, now he's coming. So I rushed out and I told everybody I was getting married the next week and, uh, and uh, you know, excited about it. And then it was Christmas morning and I went to church in Hong Kong and uh, I had heard this sermon preached lots of times on what the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh represents. But right in the midst of it, that's why you can't, you can't close yourself off because you know the facts of a sermon. Because it's not facts that we're listening to. We're listening to the spirit beyond the facts, beyond the details. Amen. I knew what the gold represented. I knew what the myrrh, I knew what the frankincense. I had heard lots of sermons at Christmas time on that. But right in the middle of the sermon, the Lord, when he said, the, pa the preacher said, our f our f the frankincense is our willing to deny ourselves for the sake of the gospel. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment. And he said, when you said last week that you were willing not to get married, he said, you thought, well, he's not coming anyway. I might as well give him to God. You know, I didn't realize I thought that, but you know, sometimes the Lord just puts his finger. And he says, now if you say yes, Lord, you're giving the frankincense of your life. You're pouring it out to me. Well, that's what I did <clears throat> in that service that morning. But you know, it's so easy to do it in the anointing. And then you go home and you're not in the anointing in the same way. Oh, you're blessed, but you're not in the anointing and not being in the anointing. And the next few months, one day I was sure, the next day I wasn't sure. It was the most miserable period of my life, several months. I, I, I wasn't miserable except in not being sure. Amen? It's not the facts of it that make the misery but it's the fact that you're not sure. One day I knew it was the will of God and the next day I wasn't sure, but it was mainly because I still was reaching out for my will. Amen, still reaching out. We all want to serve God, but we want to serve him on our terms. We all want to serve God, but we always want to serve him in the way that we want to serve him. We want God in the situation just as we've uh, uh, ordained it and organized it and arranged it. When God wants to sometimes do it differently. And all those months were terrible. I'm not a sad person, but I tell you, I was miserable. I don't think I was sad, but I was miserable. You know, sometimes when we're miserable, uh, we make others miserable. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But one night I had this dream. And in the dream, I saw the most beautiful house. And I saw murals on the wall. And I always liked houses that, you know, had murals painted on the wall. And um, I saw myself with this beautiful little boy in my arms, red hair, just like this person had. And I was talking to people in the dream. 
And I said, everything is wonderful. It couldn't be better. There's only one thing that bothers me. I can never work for God again. And in that moment, I knew I could never marry him. In that moment, I was born to work for God. I was brought into the world to work for God. Everything in my life, I can, through the years, I can close the door again and again on anything that would keep me from working for God. There are lots of opportunities, lots of situations, and they look wonderful, but when it comes to the test, can I work for God? I just slam the door behind me and walk on. Amen. Now, he loved the Lord, and he was a preacher. <clears throat> and I wrote him a letter, and I said, this is what I dreamed what do you think about it? He said to me in a letter, he said, uh, how do I know what's going to happen in the future, whether or not you would be able to work for God? Now what I was hoping he would say is, no matter whatever happens in the future, we will always put the work of God first. Amen. That's all you have to say. The way you, the way you settle your life is God comes first. The family comes second. Now, there are some people today that are preaching differently, but it's not according to the word of God. I don't care what you do in your life. God's always got to be number one. <laughs> And your family's got to be number two. And I've seen preachers put their families first uh, and, uh, and God second. Uh, and their lives have ended up shipwrecks. And there's a lot of teaching that goes the other way. But I'm telling you, no matter what you do in life, if you do nothing but scrub floors, uh, God's still got to be first. Hallelujah. God first, your family next, uh, and yourself last. Amen. God, mother and dad put God first. And I guess there could have been times if we, as children, you know, we probably thought mother was on the telephone too much talking to the parishioners at just the moment that we had the most, uh, you know, the emergencies of life. But have my brother and I come short? No. We haven't come short uh, of them putting God first. I don't know of any family in the world that's been blessed any more than our family's been blessed. Oh, yes. Uh, the blessing of God that has been upon us, the amazing doors uh, that God has opened, bringing us just uh, from such humble uh, beginnings and what God has done. He says, I'll take you uh, and I'll lift you out of the dung heap and I'll set you among the princes uh, of my people. Uh, and God will do that, but you have to settle the issue. Now, God was just speaking to me that there, before I came down that there were some folks that had a little misery in their life. If you're a little miserable, it's because you haven't settled the issue totally concerning the will of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. He's still trying to cling to this and reach out for that. Oh, no, let go and let God lead you on into the fullness of the blessing of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. God wants you to be happy. When I settled it in my heart and my spirit, uh, within a few months, uh, I don't know, I guess just in a short time after I really settled it in my heart and my spirit, I got an invitation to represent Full Gospel Businessmen's chapter from Hong Kong at a big convention in, uh, in uh, 
Zurich, Switzerland, and I went flew over there and got invited back uh, by Brother uh, Samuel Doctorian, who was the speaker at this large gathering of about 5,000 people, invited back with that, the, all the leadership, the, the executive board of full gospel businessmen back to the Middle East. And one night while I was, we were praying in the garden tomb, God spoke to me and said, just before I come, I have something great for you to do in this city. Amen. It was the beginning of a whole new pattern and plan of God. Hallelujah. That would never have happened if I hadn't let go. Amen. Listen, I would have been an ordinary Virginia housewife. My friend married a very wonderful person that was actually in ministry and I don't think she's ministered once since they got married don't think once she was one of our best people in the Philippines one of our best missionaries exactly like the Lord had said amen exactly like the Lord had said you don't think it uh, you always see a way that maybe we can do this and this and this uh, but listen God's got plans it may not be marriage something else God's speaking to you about but God has the greater for you can't we trust him I remember one time in Jerusalem some of you met brother Vaughn Gerald that was here this past week Brother Von Gerald was just learning to trust God. And I was teaching one morning in Jerusalem concerning uh, uh, trusting God for everything. And I didn't know it, but God was speaking to him about trusting him for his clothing. But you know how you think, well, God's got bad taste. You wouldn't mind God giving you the money and then you go out and buy it. But somehow God's got bad taste and, uh, well, we don't say it, but that's what we think. Let God give me the money and I'll go out and I'll find that wonderful outfit. Well, God had been speaking to him <laughs> and uh, that day in the prayer meeting, he said, yes, Lord, I'm going to trust you also for my clothes and somebody arrived about a week later with my brother's tour now you saw how big brother Vaughn is I mean he's tall six foot something and big a and there happened to be there were two people on, in our ministry that day that God was dealing with one was exceptionally small very short I'm trying to think of who what person they would be like here uh, here in our ministry, I can't think right off of a person that's quite that short, and they were very small, and the other was exceptionally tall. And do you know on that trip of my brothers, there was a brother just Brother Vaughn size, <laughs> and another brother that was just this other brother's size, and both people uh, God spoke to. Nobody knew what God was saying, they had both just bought brand new wardrobes for their trip. Brand new suits and shirts and ties and everything to match. And they walked up to both people and said, God told me not to take my wardrobe back to America, but to leave it with you. And here this little brother that was so short, he had a new wardrobe. And Brother Vaughn that was so tall, he had a new wardrobe. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whether it suits or whatever it is, God's got good taste. Hallelujah, if he's planning your life, He'll plan for you bigger things than you could ever think for yourself. That's why I'm so glad that Mother taught us this little poem when we were children. God knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those 
who leave the choice with him. Hallelujah. And lots of times when I'm praying, I say, Lord, you choose. Now, we hear these sermons in which uh, people say, if you want a red car, name what color you want, name the style you want, name the... And that, that's possible. But I find that sometimes God's got something different that's better. Maybe something I've never seen that's better. <laughs> something I wouldn't even know how to ask for that's better. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's got, uh, he's got the whole catalog of heaven. Hallelujah. He doesn't just have Bloomingdale's and uh, Saks and a... Oh, no. He's got the catalog of heaven, folks. Uh, he knows exactly... And when you say, Lord, I don't want to choose, I want you to choose for me, he'll lift you up into realms beyond anything that you've ever known and ever experienced. And you'll say, am I here? <laughs> One of our little sisters, I remember the afternoon, Sister Janet came, I was sitting at the organ little Baptist girl from down in the northern neck of Virginia. She came up to me and she said, Sister, I've never been filled with the Spirit. I said, well, should I pray for you now? She said, I'd like you to. And I laid my hand on her head and she began to speak in other tongues. God took this girl from a little crossroads in Virginia that's all, they had a grocery store and one house. Their little town of Tidewater, Virginia, that's all it was, a house and a crossroads, and it's not much more than that today. But God began to elevate her. And I've seen her sit in poverty in Jerusalem for world leaders. I've seen her, seen her sit. Nobody and ever came to Jerusalem from any foreign, from uh, any ministry in the world that ever was given more favor than little Janet was given. Hallelujah! She, when she first came, you couldn't even hear her voice as she prayed. She, if she testified, you. God began to put a prophetic flow into her life and into her spirit, almost finer prophetic word than most anybody I know in the world. Yes, she sat down and entertained people from all over the world and sat and talked about the things of God, walked up here from a little crossroad in Virginia. She wouldn't have known what to ask for. No. God had great plans. Great plans for her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's got plans for you beyond what you can perceive or understand. How does it come? It comes by revelation in the Spirit. Let go. Come in empty. Come in. That's why worship is so beautiful. It's because we pour out everything that's within us. Amen. You begin to pour out. <laughs> Lord, you're my only desire. I don't want anything but you, oh Lord. I desire you more than anyone, more than anything. To sit in your presence. I don't care where I sit in your presence. If I sit in Virginia or North Carolina, I don't care where I sit with you. I'm willing, Lord, to sit with you, to walk with you, to talk with you wherever you want to take me. And you just begin to worship and pour out, amen, your soul to the Lord. <laughs> and then when he needs somebody to do this... <laughs> <laughs> or to do that, uh, he'll lift you from the dung heap. Oh, yes, he'll lift you from the low place. Uh, hallelujah, he'll just lift you up and he'll set you uh, among the, the princes of his people. Uh, he'll open doors for you. Hallelujah, wonderful doors. 
wonderful doors. Sister Carneal mentioned the fact that only last fall did I discover that I was the one that had prophesied over Brother Benny Hinn before he went into ministry. In fact, when my brother called me and told me, I said, oh, no, no, I've never prophesied over Brother Benny Hinn. He had been with him the night before down at Virginia Beach. I said, oh, no, 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 I've never been with, never prophesied over him. He said, wait a minute, let me tell you. So he told me what Benny Hinn had said to him the night before. When I was in Oslo a few months ago, he got up in front of all the people and told them. In fact, he, he said to Charlie, you folks know Charlie, that he said to Charlie, he said, any meeting of mine that she wants to come to, he said, you send her a ticket. Let her come from anywhere in the world. <clears throat> Well, I haven't had time to take advantage of that yet, but <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I remember one night in Jerusalem, <clears throat> we had a, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and there were always wonderful speakers, and usually when they give, in the evening when they introduce the speaker, it's sort of a, a low-key introduction. But this night, I mean, the introduction went on and on and on, and I thought, who is this man they're introducing? They said he's preached in at least 50 stadiums of 300,000 each, and he began telling what had happened to him and things that were going on in his life. And usually, I, you know, I feel Jerusalem's my city. So anybody that comes, I go and welcome them, just like the mayor would. I mean, after all, it's my city. I longer he's only been mayor a few years and I've been there believing God for 24 years for the city so I I've got a longer relationship with the city so I always go and tell the person how happy I am that they've come and blessed our city this particular night there were so many people crowded around I couldn't get up to him so the next night I saw him standing right down front there were about four or five thousand people in the meeting and I just walked over to him and I said, uh, uh, I'm Ruth Heflin, and I was going to say I'm a pastor here in the city and want to thank you for coming to bless our city. And when I said I'm Ruth Heflin, he said, oh, Sister Ruth, you don't need to introduce yourself to me. He said, everything that's happened to me began with that prophecy I received in your church on Mount Zion years ago. And in fact, he said, what they said about my ministry last night is only a portion of what God has done in my life. He said, in fact, I had certain limitations put on me as to what I could do. But he said, I've seen such miracles. And he began to go on and on and on an African brother from South Africa being used greatly of God. Numerous times we've had people say this. Why? Because we take the limits off of God. These little folks that come along, oh, hallelujah, when God speaks and says he wants to do great things, we believe it. Amen. And we encourage the minute. Oh, hallelujah. You say, well, I didn't come here for a life-changing experience. I just came here for a little extra blessing. It reminds me of the time that <laughs> my father was having the tent meeting, and he had always had great miracles of healing. And this brother came up to be prayed for in the meeting. My father, he was on a crutch, and maybe two crutches, I don't recall, but I mean, everybody that would see him come up would see him on the crutches. And if he didn't go away off of the crutches, they'd think God didn't heal him. And the Lord gave my father a word of knowledge, and the Lord, and he said to the brother, he says, you didn't come to be prayed for for your your, your legs and your physical condition, did you? And he says, no. He said, I came to be prayed for for my cold. Oh, he said, my dad said, I just wanted the people to know you didn't want prayer. See, he was getting insurance or something for his, 
his physical condition, but he didn't want to be bothered with that cold. So my father prayed for him for the cold, and he was healed, <laughs> healed instantly, but he didn't want all that was available. He had another agenda, and sometimes uh, we come to camp meeting, we said, no, no, I just wanted to be, I, 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 I didn't want my wife and I to have such problems. I wanted this marital problem settled, or, uh, or, or I wanted this other aspect of my life settled a little bit. I just wanted a little extra blessing, not a life-changing experience. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah, when you come to Jerusalem, you get life-changing experiences. When you come into the glory, you get life-changing experiences. Hallelujah. And if you move with the cloud, you'll always have life-changing experiences. Notice this. They never went back to the place from whence they came when they followed the cloud. Now, I'm not talking about just physically, because God also establishes people. God brought mother and dad to Richmond and established them in Richmond, and, uh, and they've been here in Richmond, Ashland, just as a, a more or less a, a, a suburbs of the Richmond area. They've been here, I don't know, 50-some years. But they've gone to the nations as well. Amen. Gone to the nations as well. God's not... Uh, just removing all of your foundations, no. But rather he is embellishing those things that he's doing in your life. And there's a further embellishment that God wants to give to you. Oh, <laughs> hallelujah, praise the Lord. Further enlargement in your life and further enlargement in your ministry. Hallelujah. And how do we get it? We get it by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. One of the strengths actually in my own life is this, is that when God speaks, I'm quick to move on it. Amen. I'm quick to move on it. Sometimes God speaks in one service and I'm off and running before sometimes by the next day. This is why with the revival, you know, a lot of these people, they want you to come, but they want to know three weeks in advance so they can advertise it. I got more invitations, but I just feel I want to hang loose. Amen. I'm going to take some of them, but I tell you, I just feel I don't want to miss <laughs> I don't want to miss these things that come forth spontaneously. As with Philip when he was suddenly just carried away from the revival down to the Ethiopian eunuch. Hallelujah. Just be carried away. Some preachers you can, you know, they get up and they're proud of the fact that they're booked for the next three years. They're going to miss out on what God's doing. Yes, they're booked for the next three years. Does that mean God can't use them? No, God can. But there may be some greater things that he would do, amen, in and through them and some new directions that would begin to come forth if they would just relax a little bit and keep their eye on the glory cloud and move forward by the spirit of the living God. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I have a policy in connection with Jerusalem. Usually when anybody asks me if they can come, I say yes. Because I'm not going to be the voice of no to hinder the call of God. And then let God lead them on as to when to come and how to come and all the other details. But I'm at least giving them an opportunity, a place that they can come to and get started from. What is this campground about? It's a place that people who have the call to the nations, they can come and live simply. 
have a little place to leave their few little belongings. Uh, amen. But they can go back and forth to the nations and have a family behind them praying. Uh, and they don't have to worry about uh, 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 paying the light bill and, the, and, the, and all the other bills, the rent and whatever's going on while they're gone. Uh, they can be free in the spirit to do the will of God and to go forth uh, and do those things God's calling them to do. Uh, Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to have that freedom within and that freedom in the circumstances of our life. Amen. Hallelujah. You can't tell you I've been in places where you just couldn't even get a phone call through. And sometimes mail never is delivered. Oh, yes, all of those things happening. But you've got to have a liberty in your spirit to do what God wants you to do when he wants you to do it. That liberty of hearing the voice of God and obeying, hallelujah, what he is telling you to do. That revelatory realm of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> By revelation, one word, if you'll look throughout the book of Acts over and over again and through Paul's ministry he said I went up by revelation amen he didn't just uh, think it was a good time to go to Jerusalem no the revelation of the spirit uh, came for him to go here and there he's praying uh, and he sees a man from Macedonia saying come over uh, into Macedonia and help us what a weak thing for him to go without an address I mean, just seeing a man from Macedonia in a vision. He probably could tell he was from Macedonia by with the clothing that he had on. And he was willing to rise up and go to Macedonia without a, a sponsoring church, uh, without anyone to meet him at the airport, uh, amen, uh, without anything being prearranged. He, in the spirit, uh, saw the vision it's, and uh, saw a man in Macedonia saying, Come over, come over, come over into Macedonia and help us. Uh, he was going to a foreign country, far from where he was, uh, but he was willing to go. And we're, the church in Macedonia is still one of the strong churches that have lasted uh, from the time of the Apostle Paul, hallelujah, that area of Greece, because he was willing to come and help, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I remember one year, I was here at camp meeting, and I had preached that afternoon, that day from the verse from Psalm 47 that says, he shall subdue the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us. What a wonderful verse. And I said to the people, I said, you know, since coming back, I had just come back from Nepal, where I had gone to witness to the royal family about Jesus. I said, since coming back from Nepal, I have such a desire to go to South America. But I said, I don't want to read about South America because if I were to choose where I was going, I'd go to Rio. <laughs> I'd go to Buenos Aires. You know, all the exciting places. But I said, I want God to choose for me. He's the one that chooses the inheritance. I tell you, it's not an inheritance if you choose it. Amen. I mean, you know how families get involved and they, they're going to tell mom what they want and tell dad what they want. No, no. Let the, let the one that's leaving the inheritance choose whether you get the diamond ring or the sapphire. Amen. That's the way inheritance. Let the, let the one that has the inheritance choose. When I finished preaching, I went and knelt down and my father laid his hand on my head and I fell back under the power of God and I began to speak in other tongues. 
But I knew instantly I was speaking in Spanish. Now, I don't know Spanish, um, you know, the usual. I know a number of choruses and a few of the little words that we all know. <clears throat> but I, I recognized I was speaking in Spanish. And then you know how when you're speaking in tongues, you don't usually uh, focus on the words you're saying. You're usually focusing on God. But I heard myself saying, Tarata, Tarata, Tarata. And I knew it was the place in South America I was to go. I knew it. I just felt that. When I got up off the floor, I was walking back across the campground. That was the year that Sister Susan came to our camp. I had met her on the boat nine years before, and she came down to hear me preach and came back to be here at the camp that summer. And she said to me, she said, uh, if you have a few minutes, I'd like to draw something for you. Well, I had my mind on this word, Tarata. And I said, well, come with me to my mother's. I was living at my mother's house. I said, come with me to my mother's house. And I said, because God's just spoken something to me I want to look up. And I, I, I wasn't paying too much attention to the fact that she was drawing because she was, uh, she's actually an art historian, but she had been teaching in an art school in Washington, D.C., and teaching a number of the children from the Kennedy administration. And she'd been sitting in our meetings drawing. You know, she'd draw people worshiping, and she was just drawing little sketches, and I'd been watching her draw during this meeting. In fact, the night before was the first time she'd ever come and knelt at our altar as an Episcopalian. She came and I had never seen anybody pray with their eyes open. She's kneeling there very properly with her eyes open, but she had seen the Lord on the cross. And the Lord said to her, Susan, I love you. And in that moment, she was born again of the Spirit. Now, this was the next day. So we go back to my mother's house, and I went and got the atlas, and I'm looking, T, 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 Tarata, Tarata, and I'm starting down. And I had given Sister Susan a piece of paper and a pencil, and just before, I, as I'm looking down the T, she says, there's a river that goes this way, and there's a river that goes this way, and here in the middle of the river is a broad-tailed sheep. I said, Susan, you had a vision. She said, listen, I don't believe in those. Let me just draw this for you. I said, what else did you see? She saw bark and canoes and Indians. Just at that moment, I found Tarata, Peru. I quickly turned, I forget, page 90, C, whatever, you know, and, and I'm looking. And I looked down, and it's the exact same map she had just drawn. Where the river was coming this way, and the river was coming this way, where she saw the broad-tailed sheep was the word Tarata. She suddenly got very nervous, because she was afraid I was going to act on it. And she didn't want to be responsible because she had drawn this little map. I said, Sister Susan, you know, I just came back from Nepal where I was sent to witness to the royal family. I didn't even have a map. And you know the success of that story. I said, now I've even got a map. Well, the next week in the campground, they took up an offering for me to go down. And I had to fly to a little place called, I flew to Peru, uh, to, uh, Lima, and then from Lima to Tacna, which was the closest place on the map where there was an airport to go to Tarata. And I got into Tacna. It's a little teeny airport. And I don't know anybody, don't know anything. And, and uh, I said to one of the men nearby I, that spoke a little English, I said, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Tarata? He said, why do you want to go to that God-forsaken place? 
Well, I knew I couldn't say I was a tourist. I would have normally said I'm a tourist and I want to go and, you know, see what's there. But when he said it was God forsaken, it didn't sound like it was a tourist center. And I sort of, I, I was thrown off balance a moment and I began to stutter a little bit and I said, uh, 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 God told me to go. Well, when I said God told me to go, he knew some, some Christians in town. He said, I'll take you to this house where the Christians are. They go up to Toronto once a month. I said, oh no, because I didn't want these Christians to think here was this strange Pentecostal uh, that was going off on wild goose chases and they were feel, would have to feel obligated to look after me. I said, no, tell me, do I go on a donkey? Do I go on a boat? Do I go on a, on, on a bus? Do I go how do I, on, a, on the back of a truck? How do I get there? He said, lady, I really don't know how to get there, but I know these people in Tacna, they go once a month up to Tarata. So I reluctantly asked him to take me there after we had found a place for me to stay. I didn't want them to feel I had to stay with them, so we found a little place for me to stay, and then he took me over. When we knocked on the door, he said something to him in Spanish and spoke. Uh, I didn't know, but... Uh, the Irish Baptist Mission Board was having their executive board meeting there in that house all week. And they were trying to decide what to do with the work in Tarata. They had a young girl that was up there and she had written bad reports back to Ireland and it was undermining their ministry. And they had met to see what to do, the one missionary couldn't go because it was up in the altitudes. And finally, you know, they would read Oswald Chambers' uh, devotional every day. Or they'd read Amy Carmichael or someone else, and every day they got the same portion. God sent Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> they said, Lord, if you could send for someone to the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, you can send someone to us from somewhere. Now that was the worst prayer they could have prayed. They didn't, you know, someone from somewhere, and I was the one that got the message. And I arrived, and of course they, they said later that we didn't know God would send a woman. And they were too polite to say, and we didn't know God would send a Pentecostal. But I prayed for the brother, and God healed him. Uh, he hadn't been able to go to the altitudes for some time. And a few days later, we went up to the altitudes. I was only there less than a week up in Tarata. God gave us more success than they had had in 30 years. Uh, hallelujah, I came back. What, what was it? Along the coast is where the Spanish live. Up there at Tarata was the beginning of where the Indians live. And the Tarata was a sheep-raising community with broad-tailed sheep, just as Sister Susan had seen. And when I came back and told her her total vision had been fulfilled in going there, she said to the Lord, if you can use me for one year, I'll give you a year of my life. And she left her teaching in, in, uh, in Washington, and I just spoke to her this morning on the telephone, I don't know, more than 25 years now, maybe 30 years of serving the Lord among the nations of the world, amen, that began with that vision. Later, Sister Susan and I went to Ireland, and we walked in to the Irish Baptist Mission executive board office and as we were there that story of those two angels that angel that came down me all the way to South America and brought was used of God to to bring healing into that situation all the Baptist churches in Ireland were open to us because of that miracle 
by revelation. Can we trust the Holy Ghost? Yes. Sister Susan and I have traveled all over the world by the revelation of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Is the Lord faithful? He is faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Does that mean you won't ever have a trial? No. That first time Sister Susan and I traveled for six months, we mainly ate bread. But we had plane tickets to go and we had miracle stories to tell as we traveled all the way from New York to Ireland to England to Paris to Istanbul to Jerusalem, all down through Africa, six months overland with the miracles of the Lord that would fulfill another book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we trust the Spirit? We can trust the Spirit. Move with the cloud. Let the Holy Ghost choose for you. Stop trying to say, Lord, I want to do your will, but let it be this way. No, let's meet God on his terms and not our own. Oh, yes, let's meet him. God will begin to show you the revelation of what he has for you. And if you're willing to move on it, it might be just something across the street. It might be up the road. But know this, if the Lord plans your life, it'll be a happy life, a glorious life, a blessed life. Amen. Hallelujah. If you try to plan it yourself, you're just going to, uh, uh, <laughs> you're just going to have your feet all tangled in the I see somebody's feet just tangled. They, they, they're having problems because they're trying to do it themselves and their feet are all tangled in the yarn and they can't go forward. But let God do it for you. Hallelujah. Lord, we just bless your people. <laughs> we bless them, O oh Lord, in the name of the Lord. We bless them to the excellency that you've called them unto. We bless them, Lord, unto the open heaven that's above their head. Let them not kick against the pricks and resist the call of God and the plan of God. Let them say, here am I, O Lord, choose for me. Here am I, O Lord, plan for me. Here am I, O Lord, do for me even according to your will. According to your purposes, shut up a kiki alamai. He could be a risi alamando, ya mama. Hallelujah. Could we just gather here at the front? Those that want to go, the lunch bell is rung, feel free to go. Great service here at three this afternoon and again tonight at eight. But God's bringing us here. These altars are, an, are altars of revelation. Move out of yourself and into the vision of the Lord. Let's see. I want to meet God on his terms, not on mine. I want to walk <clears throat> in his way, not in mine. For I know that it shall be his highest way for me when I live in his will, not in mine. Come along with me. I want to meet God on his terms. Not on mine. I want to walk in his way, not in mine. For I know that it shall be his highest way for me. In his will, not in mine. Karen, what 
I'm seeing for you, <clears throat> I'm seeing you with something in your hand that looks like a basketball. I know it's your ministry that God's showing me, the things that he has for you. But you know how at a basketball game, I don't know enough of the titles of the players, but the person that's got the ball, he's got all these people around him trying to get it out of his hands before he can throw it. And you have to learn to sort of, you know, pivot around with it in your hand so nobody gets the ball. <laughs> So you can throw it, oh, hallelujah. The enemy will try through many good people to take out of your hands that great thing that God has for you, but it's for you to throw. Amen. It's your calling, your anointing, your ministry. Does that mean that you don't have team players? Yes, you do. But when those others come and they're trying to block it in any way, just want to get their hand on the ball themselves. Remember this vision. It's been put into your hand. It's a sacred trust from God. It'll leave your hand lots of times like the ball does in the team. And, but you've got to always be the one to throw it and get those scores. Amen. Let it drop through the loop. Oh, the hoop. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Those that didn't see Sister Karen slides, maybe she can do it again tomorrow at quarter after two so some of you can see her slides of the ingathering of the Russian Jews from the nations of the world back to Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to meet God on his terms, not on mine. 